So I want to go ahead and welcome everyone to the current topics in autism series. This is week six of our six week series and our last meeting of the uh, session. We hope to be doing this again in the future. We invite any of you who have ideas for future sessions or topics to email us and I'll give you that email information at the end so that you can reach out to us if you're interested in that. Today's topic is when my ASD child becomes an adult, what will happen? And I think this is a really important and timely topic for all of us. So that's going to be the focus of today's session. I want to introduce myself first. My name is Shirley Fett. I am a family nurse practitioner. I am also a pediatric mental health specialist certified. I work for the Vista Hill Foundation here in San Diego in the Smart Care Behavioral Health Consultation Program. We provide support and linkage for individuals that are seeking mental health services in San Diego County. And I'd like to have my co-presenter today and my wing woman uh, also introduce herself if she wouldn't mind. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Good to see some friendly faces again. Uh, this is Alyssa Label. Uh, I am the program manager of Smart Care Behavioral Health Consultation Services, and I'm so happy to be presenting today with Shirley uh, on our last of this current series um, um, that we've been putting together. Um, I am also a member of the Autism Society Board, and I have a younger brother who is 30 five years old, uh, who has autism. Great, thank you, Alyssa. This series is being presented in collaboration with the Autism Society San Diego. And as Alyssa mentioned, she's a board member. I am also a volunteer board member with the organization. Information about the Autism Society San Diego can be found here. You can always call the office, email us, and learn about the many different things that we have had going on and hope to have going on now that COVID seems to be lifting a little bit, but we are still very active and have a lot of support meetings that we are able to stay connected to all of you. So uh, my interest uh, personally is I am the mother of two adult sons with autism spectrum disorder. They are would be considered level three with intellectual disability and with language delay. They still live with my husband and I, and I'm very invested in making sure they have a secure bright future as they are living their adult lives. So I've learned a lot about the journey and the transition from younger school age, high school age to the adult arena for individuals on the autism spectrum here in San Diego. So that was part of the impetus for today's lecture, but I know there's also quite a lot of questions and interest in this area. So hopefully this will be of some help to you. If you would like a copy of these slides at the end, I will share with you an email address. You can reach out to myself and Alyssa. We would be happy to share these slides with you. This session is also being recorded. I hope to have all six of these current topics in autism lecture series available on our YouTube channel within the next week or so. Uh, and so all six of these, including today, should be um, able to be viewed at that location. We will not be taking questions during the session. However, I plan to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So if you do have questions, just put them in the chat here on the Zoom um, channel, and we will make sure to get to as many of those as possible at the end of the session. So let's get to it. Uh, let's talk about being a grown up. So reality, uh, children with autism become adults with autism. Who knew, right? Uh, I think when you have a child that's diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, there's so much energy, so much effort put into, and rightfully so, put into figuring out what it all means, what do I need to do, and myself included, that's as it should be and what we do. But it quickly goes by, and the reality is they're adults a lot longer than their children. So I think our efforts in this area in developing and thinking about what adult life may and should look like for them should be a high priority, particularly as they get to enter into middle school and a little bit older and, and that transition age is starting to come upon us. Some unfortunate but reality check statistics, most adults with autism, 80% still live with their parents after high school, 80%. 85% of autism spectrum adults who graduate from college are still unemployed. So that really speaks to what, even if your child does not have an intellectual delay or is actually gifted or bright academically, 
you still really, really need to be thinking about and focusing on the other skill sets that they need to be successful in the adult arena, because this statistic is startling to me. They, these are 85% of those individuals with autism who, in fact, were able to go to college and successfully graduate are still unemployed. So that's a big issue. Unemployment among people with autism is approximately 90%. 85% of autism spectrum adults live with their parents. Oh, I had that up there again. So 80 to 85, sorry, I had that twice. And 40% of individuals with autism will not achieve a high school diploma. Of those who attend college, only 40% complete and graduate. So some individuals are able to get into college and they go, 40% of them graduate. And of those 40% that finally get to the finish line and graduate, 85% of them are still unemployed. So there's a lot, lot of work to be done figuring out what's going on in this population of, of our children at, of, that are becoming adults. There's about 50,000 children with autism that turn 18 every year in the United States. So it is a large group and large number of individuals who are entering the adult arena with autism spectrum disorder. And the needs are great. And I think that we're behind the eight ball a little bit, but that doesn't mean lots can't be done. So what are the burning questions as, as uh, individuals on the spectrum become adults. What happens when they finish high school? What services and programs are available in San Diego for adults with autism? Where will they live as an adult? Who will support them in adulthood financially? And who will care for them when I am gone? These are the big questions that I think, if you haven't thought about them, you will, because um, I know most of my peers who have adult children, this is the things we worry about. So if you are in a situation where your son or daughter has not exited public school or school-based services, transition planning is really, really important to be part of the planning conversation at your IEP meetings. The IDEA requires statements and discussion about transition planning happen when the individual turns 16. I would encourage those of you who have younger ch children to actually start having that conversation much younger, 14, 13 years old even. I, I always pose this question, if you had a non-autistic child and you, they were in high school, what age would you typically start talking to them about what do they wanna do after they leave high school? Do you wait till they're a junior? sophomore, junior in high school? No, nobody does that, right? I mean, most of the time people or parents are talking to their kids in middle school about, you know, maybe what are you thinking about you want to do when you graduate? What would you like to be when you grow up kind of conversation? So I think that age 16, while it's mandated and it's a must by law, I think we all need to really push the envelope with our IEP planning teams to say, no, I want to start talking about transition planning much earlier. They may look at you like you have two heads, but you are perfectly within your rights to start talking about transition planning and what needs to happen for this individual, particularly if your child is going to graduate at 18. That's only two years to really think about this. Uh, if your child's not diploma bound, then they have until age 22, but that's still only six years to really address some of the bigger issues that they need to have in place for success into adulthood. The types of things you can talk about are, are, are they, are they gonna go to college? Are they gonna graduate and go to college? Okay, what do we need to do to help them be successful? Uh, as I said in the earlier slide, only 40% of individuals that go to college make it. Um, a lot of times it's because the social pressures are, too overwhelming and they, and they become overwhelmed and can't successfully um, exist in that environment. So maybe vocational ed is where you wanna go. Integrated employment, or what kind of jobs um, might they be interested in? Maybe they're a candidate for continuing in adult education. Or if we know this person isn't going to achieve a traditional high school diploma and is gonna get a certificate of completion, what are the adult services in our community that we might be looking at and thinking about could be a good fit as they get older? Will they need to figure out how they're going to live independently from us? What kind of community participation do we want them to have? And then there's something called a person-centered plan, which is um, something that you can also start and develop at the transition age. Person-centered planning, by the way, if you Google it and read about it, is, is just a big meeting with all the key players in the individual's life that focuses on the individual with autism. They are the person at the center of the plan. It's driven by their wants, their desires and needs, and you invite all people that are important in that person's life to the person-centered planning meeting, and you develop a plan on how they might get to the places they wanna go. Maybe their goal is I want to go to Disneyland once a year. 
that could be part of their person-centered plan. It doesn't all have to be vocational and academic. It can also be social. I want to um, live in my own apartment. I want to always live with my mom and dad. It can be anything, but a person-centered plan can really help drive what the transition team needs to look at to help develop their life plan. So how are adult services um, accessed or received here in San Diego County? The San Diego Regional Center does become the home base for most services. We get used to the school districts being the home base, if you will, or the center of all things in our children's lives for the most part uh, throughout the early childhood, elementary, middle, and high school years. But once an individual exits public school, regional center becomes home base or the center of services and case management for the individual. If you, your child is not a regional center client, they need to become one because you need them to access many things and they are also going to be able to pay for many of the services we are going to talk about today. Adult services and resources are provided primarily through a combination of county, state, and federal funding sources. Again, Regional Center helps us access those, and some adult services are also through private pay, meaning we pay for it as the parents. So let's see, that slide, I think. Um, yeah, so let's talk about um, education. The first thing you need to think about with the person with autism spectrum disorder is, as I mentioned earlier, are they diploma? Um, are they going to successfully get a diploma? And by the way, just because someone turns 18 and they still haven't gotten a diploma because they haven't met all the academic requirements, that doesn't mean they can't continue to work towards a diploma if you think they can achieve it. Individuals are with uh, IEPs can access public school services until the age of 22. I've had some peers in San Diego whose children got a diploma from high school when they were 20 or 21 years old. It just took them a little bit longer. So I want to let you know that just because they turn 18 doesn't mean that process has to stop. They can still continue to strive for a diploma if it's deemed that they can meet the academic um, requirements to do so. If it's determined that the individual is not going to be able to achieve a diploma, then we think about a certificate of completion, which is essentially saying they completed school. It's not a diploma. It's not the same thing as a diploma. This is what my children um, receive from the school district. Those individuals with um, a certificate of completion typically receives school-based services through public school until the age of 22. They, they provide transition services and this type of thing. Um, so what are some other educational options once they leave school, either at the time of achieving a diploma or once they get their certificate of completion? Well, there are some continuing education options here in San Diego. There's something called College to Career, which can be funded by the Department of Rehab. There are different four credit vocational programs at the San Diego Community Colleges. I've listed quite a few of the community colleges. You would contact the Community College Disabled Student Services departments directly at these campuses. And you would say, I'm interested in learning what disabled um, student service programs you have. A number of the campuses also offer non-credit classes through disabled student program services. Um, these can be things on financing, personal hygiene, social skills. I've listed some of the schools that I know offer these, and these are non-credit classes. Again, contact disabled student services, and they can connect you to those. Certainly, someone could be taking both, right? They could be taking some of the non-credit classes and the credit classes. Uh, other educational opportunities is a college living experience. This is a sort of like a summer camp on a college campus, for lack of better terms. It gives individuals who are thinking that they might want to actually live on campus or go to college and live away from home. It, they bring them onto campuses. Same thing with Project College at USD. For a week, they have tutors and mentors there to sort of help them navigate. This is what college would look like. This is where the cafeteria is. This is what a dorm room looks like. This is where shared bathrooms look like and sort of get them acclimated so they understand what college looks like. The student does not have to be enrolled or planning to attend that particular college. It's more just an overview of what college might look like. 
There's also something called a tailored big day program. And I'll talk about that a little bit more through San Diego Regional Center. Tailored day program basically just provides you with a one-on-one -on -one, uh, person to be with you. And tailored day program uh, helpers can help a student by attending classes with them and help them navigate. And as I mentioned, disability support programs and services through community colleges. There is a vocational program that a local nonprofit that's run by a couple of parents, they have um, a son similar age to my son's uh, called NFAR, National Foundation for Autism Research. They primarily have programs that are designed for a data entry, computer um, entry, uh, programming computer classes. I believe they did get approved for funding through the Department of Rehab, so that may be an option for some of you, and I would encourage you to go to their website and look at what they have to offer, but it is specifically designed for individuals with autism and disabilities to learn how to do those skills with the hope that they will get jobs in that area. Um, here's a menu of all the different San Diego Regional Center services for adults. So as I mentioned earlier, it's really important for adults to get connected to the regional center because there's a lot of different things that the regional center has to offer. As in school, as in any other service you've probably tried to access or work with for your children throughout your life, you have to be an advocate. You have to know what you want. I would love to tell you that as you sit, as you're planning meetings and, and work out the details of that, that you um, are gonna get this lovely menu put in front of you and you're gonna say, I want this, this, and this, and this. You need to be educated. I often tell people that I felt like when my sons were exiting school and transitioning to adult services, I felt a lot of similar feelings that I did when they were first diagnosed. It was like a brave new world. I thought, I have no idea what this looks like or how this is all gonna to fit together. And I really had to spend some time educating myself, asking a lot of questions about these different things, chatting with other parents, perhaps whose kids were already in some of these programs and just doing a lot of my own homework. And I'm gonna tell you that's the way it's gonna be. Uh, they're not gonna um, be able to hand it to you on a platter. You're gonna to have to go out and learn about these different things and ask questions about them and see if they're a good fit potentially for your loved one. So as stated here, there's adult day programs, there's a tailored day program, there's supported employment, there's supported living. They also provide independent life skills training. There's the paid internships that individuals can get. Uh, Self-determination, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. It's coming on the horizon for all of us. You are still, if you didn't know this, but um, this has always been the case. Parents can request tuition to attend one conference a year up to a value of $200 from regional center. They will pay for that for you. You can still get respite care into adulthood. Regional center helps with housing. They don't pay for it, but they help you find it and figure out how, what kind of housing is gonna be a good fit. Uh, there, you can get in-home behavioral consultations. You can get assistance with insurance co-pays, just like much of you, many of you may have gotten co-pay assistance for ADA therapy these days. Uh, if there's co-pays for other services that your adult child is receiving and it's, it's cost prohibitive, they can assist with that. There's crisis intervention services uh, through regional center called Safety Alert and the START program. And the regional center is a player when you, if, if and when you decide to apply for conservatorship for your adult child. So as you can see, there's many things here that regional center can do for you and for your child. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on some of these adult programs that the regional center funds. Uh, adult day program, this is what my sons are currently enrolled in. The adult day program is a community-based program provided by the San Diego Regional Center, available based on the IPP. So IPP, for those of you, just as a refresher, it's sort of like your IEP with the Regional Center. It's your goals and plans for the individual outside that educational arena. So as part of the IPP, you would sit down and say, well, I'd like them to be in working 20 hours a week. I'd like them to learn how to independently do their own budget. Whatever the cases may be, you need to include that in the IPP. So requesting adult day program services would be part of that plan um, and a focus on the individual's person-centered plan. So these programs typically are anywhere from 25 to 30 hours per week. The typical ratio is one staff to three participants or one staff to four in the community. For individuals who have more behavioral challenges and cannot successfully be in the community at all or be in the community at that staffing ratio, there are some adult 
day program providers that have what we call site-based services, meaning you get dropped off at their facility or at their site and you don't go anywhere in the community. You're just on their campus or at their facility all day long doing different things. One of the things I often will suggest to uh, family members, if they're, they anticipate that their um, child as they transition out of school will need to be in an adult day program is include in your IEP goal that my child will successfully be able to be in the community at a one to three or one to four ratio. We had that as an IEP goal for probably four or five years because my sons had typically had a one to one throughout school. And I knew that one to one wasn't going to happen in the adult programs um, very easily anyway. And so it's a reasonable thing to think about, including that in your transition planning and in your goal writing, if you feel that your child, you want your child to be in a non-site based program. And my sons like to be out in the community. They like to be going to Melville Park. They like to be volunteering. So being at a site based really wasn't gonna be ideal for them. And I wanted them to be in the community more. So that was an IEP goal that I had in there on both of their plans. Uh, so what can we hope an adult day program provider would offer and do would help the individual develop and maintain self-help and self-care skills. Um, there's some social interaction. Uh, they're, like I said, they're in groups of three or four, the ability to interact with others and making one's needs known and responding to instructions. Developing some self-advocacy and employment skills. So um, a lot of the activities my sons do, and I do think this is true of all the adult programs, is they can actually go and volunteer at places like Feeding America. And I've got them volunteering at a couple other um, nonprofits in the area. And it's, it's really worked out really nicely. Developing community integration skills, such as accessing community services. Um, so um, this is a quick kind of cute example. You know, Mother's Day was last weekend. And so my husband worked with the job coach and my son's um, program and they went to um, Starbucks and got me gift cards. They went to the store and bought me Mother's Day cards and got all that ready to go for me. So, you know, just accessing and being in the community and doing what you would hope um, your adult children would, would do. So those are the kinds of things they worked on as well in, in, a, in a very natural way. Behavior management to help improve behaviors and developing social and recreation skills. So that's, that's the overarching targets of the adult day program. As mentioned, there is another option called a tailored day program. And when your child's exiting school, it's going to be really important that you invite your regional center case manager to your IEP meetings because they need to know what the team is saying, what the school is saying. And I'm not saying they should come to your very last IEP on the very last day of school. They really should start coming one, two years before your child is due to exit school-based services so they can really start helping you, helping the individual carve out and plan for the next step. Some um, individuals don't want to do an adult day program or they don't like it or the family says that's not going to work for my child. So the regional center came up with a different choice, which is called the tailored day program. The tailored day program is community based again and is available based on the IPP again and focus on the individual's goals and needs. It's a much fewer hours per week because it's one on one. What happens is if you decide you want tailored day, the regional center says, okay, and then you pick one of the over 30 vendored agencies in town that provide adult services and you interview them just like you would a school or check out a school, you'd interview these um, pro program providers and you say, okay, I think that's going to be a good fit for my son. Then they would assign a worker to your child, your adult child for this purpose and based on the goals and the needs of the individual and how many hours a week you have, they would start working on the specific targets for this individual. The types of things could include working on employment, maybe supporting them, as I said earlier, going to college classes, post-secondary education, um, maybe it's socialization and recreation. Um, my sons on um, one day a week go to the Y as part of their adult day program and they work out for an hour. So maybe that's what you need to do is help them get comfortable with um, social and rec activities. And it could be independent living skills as well. Again, this list is by no means um, all inclusive. It's really designed as the name says to be tailored to the individual. So let's say, yeah, I don't think that adult day program is a good fit. And I don't think the tailored day program is really a good fit. My, my person really wants to work. They want to get a job. That's their thing. And while, yes, you can get work on employment and jobs in the other two service models, this one is 100% focused on work. 
So it's called supported employment and it's an employment arrangement for integrating people with intellectual disabilities into the workforce. It's a form of employment in a competitive workforce in which the wages and benefits from an employer are expected. So in this situation, uh, they help the individual, one, work on their job skills, get their resume applications out to employers. They try and identify employers that they feel the person would be a good fit the person would enjoy. It can be either individual or in a group setting, but often it could be in a group setting where it could be um, up to th three to eight individuals, one job coach. I think that's all to be negotiated depending on what the needs of the individual are. The funding to for the job coach and to get this done can either come from the Department of Rehabilitation or the Regional Center. If the Department of Rehab is the funder for supported employment services, they don't go on forever and ever. They typically have a finite period of time that they'll fund, which is 24 months. Let's say at, at two years into it, uh, your family member still needs a job coach to check in on them, you know, maybe once a week or once every two weeks, they're not quite fully able to be uh, without any support at all. Then you would go back to the regional center and say, hey, we still need some supported employment services. And then they would pick up and continue paying if that was deemed appropriate. I will share with you that the Department of Rehab actually has a program starting at age 16. So again, if you think your child who's in that age group would really benefit from getting an early start on some work skills and some employment, and maybe 16, you know, 16 year olds like money. So maybe they really would like the idea of working. There is a program specifically that the regional center works with the DOR to offer opportunities for 16 and older. So um, just putting that out there for those of you, it doesn't just start when they exit school. There are programs at 16 in this arena for uh, individuals It's in the supported employment area. And then, so those are the service models. Uh, I'm gonna talk in a little bit about self-determination, but historically those uh, three broad categories were the only choices and they certainly were the only choices that we had when our sons were exiting school. It was either an adult day program, supported employment or a tailored day program, and that was it. And you can't have a hybrid of any of them. So for example, you can't say, well, you know, I think I'd like them to go to an adult day program Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, I'd like them to, to be in the supported employment realm. They wouldn't let you do that. It's, you, you have to choose your lane and they expect you to stay in it. And that's still the case for the traditional service model, but it will be changing soon. Again, to be continued here. Um, so let's talk about a different aspect of adult life. And that is, where is this person going to live? Regional Center, funds a program called Supported Living Services. And this is a broad range of services for adults with developmental disabilities who, again, through the IPP, your, your yearly plan or your life plan, choose to live in homes they own or lease in the community. This is available starting at age 18 years old and Supported Living Services may include assistance with selecting and moving into their own home, choosing personal attendants and housemates, acquiring household furnishings, um, assistance with common daily living activities and how to manage emergencies, uh, helping them become a participating member in community, helping with managing their personal finances, as well as other supports. And then the last thing I just put here is also um, accessing, signing up for Section 8, which is the low-income vouchers that are available in uh, San Diego. So if you have an 18-year-old or older and you're not on the Section 8 housing list, even if you're like, I don't want them to move out right now, the wait list is over 10 years right now for Section 8 vouchers. So I would encourage you to just get your name on the list. And if it comes up by some miracle and you're not ready, you just say, I'm not ready right now, go on to the next person on the list. But I do encourage people. It's really easy to do. You just you know, Google Section 8 Housing San Diego and there's an online application you fill out. But uh, I would encourage you to consider that. This service, Supported Living Services, is in addition to the adult programs I've already mentioned. So if you're getting let's say you're in supported employment, you can be in a supported employment model, getting the support and services from regional center in that arena. And you can also be getting supported living services additionally. So they don't cancel each other out. You can actually get both at the same time, if that's appropriate for you. So someone might very well get supported employment, go to their job 20 or 30 hours a week. And then when they come home, they may have 
a paid roommate, housemates, other service providers coming in and out of the home to help them in these other areas. Because as you can see on here, the bulk of these are really about integrating into the community and being independent. These are not about work, it's about living. So again, you could access uh, both if needed. Another service that Regional Center will fund is called Independent Life Skills. And you're eligible starting at age 18 or when you finish school. So again, individuals who are still in public school up till age 22 may be able to get this. I've heard of a few people being able to access independent life schools, even while they're, they're, um, their child is still getting school services. I'm not here to tell you that is or isn't possible. The current criteria is either 18 or when they finish school. So say, for example, your person, your child is 18, they graduated from high school, so school services ended, but you know for a fact they are not going to launch into independent life because they don't have independent life skills. Skills. They don't know how to go buy groceries. They don't know how to do laundry. They don't know how to get from point A to point B on the bus. Uh, all of these kinds of things that a person really needs to be successful in life. This is where independent life skills could be a benefit to them. Independent life skills can be for individuals that are higher need. Uh, you just want this person to be able to make their bed and vacuum their room and do dishes and learn how to load the dishwasher. It can be anything in this arena that are life skills, things that are gonna help them be more independent. So money management, again, could be in this category, meal planning and prep, health maintenance, helping them learn how to maybe schedule doctor's appointments, how to go to a doctor's appointment, Perhaps it's taking medication that they need practice with and teaching could be how to navigate social activities, home safety, and individuals um, that are regional center clients, some of them are parents. And so they even will help with parenting skills if it's appropriate. So again, you could be getting supported employment. You could be getting supported living, and then you could also be getting independent life skills as a third service. Again, this is not to the exclusion of the others. It's not like you can only choose one of them. You could theoretically have all of these services, and the coordinator at the regional center would help figure out what the best fit and what the best um, way to put all of these services together should you so desire. Another interesting thing that a lot of people don't know about at Regional Center, but is an option, is a paid internship. Uh, the purpose of this program is to increase vocational skills and abilities of clients who choose, through their plan, to pro uh, through their pro planning process, to participate in an internship. The goal of this particular program includes the acquisition of the experience and skills for future paid employment, or hopefully, you're an intern for one of these businesses, and they say, "Hey, you're great. We're going to hire you." So that would be the, the ultimate outcome of an internship. The individual is either learning a job in a typical setting, a specific trade or a craft, or starts a micro enterprise for their own employment. This, this program in particular is funded through the state of California's Department of Developmental Services in conjunction with the regional center. Um, so let me give you an example of what that might be looking like. Uh, one of my peers has a son who can drive. He graduated from high school and he really, really wants to be um, like a, a delivery driver for FedEx or UPS. So she was in communication with the regional center about how can we get him an internship at one of those places with the idea in mind that once he got in, he could do the job. You go there, you work just like you're an employee, but regional center, I think, pays up to $10,000 for the internship. So there is an incentive for these businesses to take on interns because they initially don't have to pay for them. But I will tell you the regional center is also very cautious about some of these businesses that they say, sure, we'll take your intern. And then they basically get free labor. And then when it's done, they say, no, we don't want, we don't want to hire anybody. So, um, you know, they definitely try and find internships where it's, there's a legitimate possibility that you could also lead to employment with that company because that's the goal. So that's what an internship looks like. So it's a bit different than um, the other employment option and programs that they offer. Self-determination, this is the big talk of the year and it's been uh, percolating for quite a few years. Uh, Self-determination is a new program, is a new service model that the regional center will be offering to everyone. It's been in the pilot stages for the last few years. And the idea is just as the name describes, allows the individual to determine for themselves what they feel the services they need for themselves. So it 
provides freedom and flexibility to plan a good life over your personal resources for building a life in the community and pride in making your own decisions in order to help you accomplish, accomplish the goals in your IPP um, person center plan. So this is hopefully gonna be available to everyone by summer. That's the rollout plan. It's been, as I said, offered to a smaller number of consumers for the last two years to try and work out the kinks. Essentially, you go to your regional center case manager and say, you know what, all of the different programs that you currently pay for for adults, they're not a good fit for my child. They're not a good fit for me. My child wants to do something completely outside the box from what you're currently offering. And right now that isn't available, but self-determination is designed to allow you to do that. You do not have an unlimited budget with self-determination. It's not like you can come and go in and say, well, I want an annual pass to Disneyland because that's really important to me. And I want to be able to go on a trip around the world because I really like to travel. What they do is they look at what amount of money the regional center was previously spending on the individual as a baseline for the budget. I'm not telling you that that's the fixed amount for the budget, but it's a starting point. If it's reasonable, the things that you are asking for, the things that you want to do, then you come up with a budget for that, and then the regional center either approves or does not approve it. There's a lot of logistics involved with this. Uh, and in order to do self-determination, as I said, you've got to come up with a plan. Uh, you try and get your family and friends incorporated into this. Your regional center service coordinator needs to be involved. Um, Usually, as part of this, you have to hire someone to be an independent facilitator to help you with this. It can be a family member or it can be a professional to help with goals and locate services and activities. And then you also have to use financial management services. The regional center just doesn't write you a personal check for you know $20,000 and say, here, spend this as you will this year. There is a intermediary called an FMS, financial management service, that the, the payment for services has to go through. So you don't get the money directly into your bank account to pay people. Um, and again, today's talk is not about self-determination, but tomorrow, <laughs> this is my segue, tomorrow the Autism Society is hosting a meeting called All Things Self-Determination. So if you're really interested in learning more details and a more eloquent explanation of it, um, I encourage you again to attend this meeting tomorrow night um, we are going to have one of our board members, Casey Howell, who has become an independent facilitator in the self-determination program. And so she is keenly and intimately aware of what self-determination looks like. She's actually working with clients that have chosen self-determination, and she can tell you the ins and outs and how to go about accessing self-determination if you are interested in that. So I do encourage any of you who are interested in self-determination or learning more to consider attending the meeting tomorrow night. If you want to attend, you can go to the meetup, San Diego Autism Society meetup site. And there's a Zoom link just like today's meeting was for that for tomorrow. And it's free and you don't have to pre-register for it. Okay, let's talk about housing. Where shall this person live? When you're looking at community-based residential services, things to consider that are very important is to make sure it provides the support needed to assist the individual to successfully live in some type of housing other than his or her family home. So that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? You would want them to choose a place that they could live where they can be successful. Well, there may be things that aren't as obvious to us if they've been living with us, like, should it be close to a bus stop? Does it need to be within walking distance of a grocery store? Uh, is it close to the people and things that they like to do if they don't drive? Again, what about mobility? What about access to their day programs? Things like that. So it's really important to take all that into consideration. You want to make sure it provides a home-like environment and with supervision as needed. Uh, you want to provide a living experience. It's going to be appropriate to the needs of the individual. Um, provide supports to successfully access the local community, as I mentioned. Um, and you want them to try and be in a community. There are some individuals who feel like their adult loved ones would do better in a more rural farm-like setting. And again, this is very individualized. So you really need to identify what you feel is going to suit your child's needs the best. My children like being in an urban environment. They like to go to places. They like to go to stores. They like to be around other people. So for them living in a more rural 
farm-like setting wouldn't work for them. Um, but again, that's something you have to think about. What's what fits their personality and their, their interests. Uh, residential choices generally fall under two categories, those that require licensing and those that don't. Pretty straightforward. And a San Diego Regional Center Service Coordinator assists with the process. I know every year when we have our meetings, our regional center case manager always asks us what our if our plans for the living arrangements for our sons has changed, and we talk about it every time. If it changes or if we want to do something different, they can help you learn about what the options are and what's available. There are some types of housing that are much harder to get into and have wait lists than others. The licensed options tend to be difficult to get into. Community care licensed facilities are going to be AKA group homes. Um, and those are difficult to get into, uh, particularly if you have a high needs individual that requires a high level of care. Uh, there's just not a lot of those there. And when people get into those, they tend to not leave. Then there's foster family agencies. Again, these have to be licensed. These are families that basically agree to foster adults. Um, just like you have foster children, they can foster adults. And so there's uh, identified homes and families that are willing to do this and they get paid to provide that service. And then of course there's medical health facilities. You know, you think about like a nursing home. I often think about what happens to my children when they're 70 or 80 or 90 and you know, they need lots of medical care. So there are health facilities uh, that might need to be an option. And those are all the licensed options. And then there's unlicensed options. So that would be um, in the independent living skills category, supported living services or adult family home agencies. So again, regional center doesn't pay for the house or the apartment. They may um, help you find it. This is a huge problem in San Diego. As no surprise to any of you, housing is extremely expensive and there is a very limited amount of low-income housing. And the low-income housing that exists gets grabbed up as soon as it's available and there's usually wait lists. So this is the ever elusive um, challenge with finding housing unlicensed. So for example, you think, well, I really would like my adult son or daughter to live in their own apartment with a paid roommate or with 24 hour support, which is possible. I know some families who have pretty high needs adult children that they're living in their own apartments or their own condos with 24 hour care paid for by various resources, including the regional center. So don't think because someone has high needs as an adult that it's not possible for them to live separate from you in an independent apartment or home, but it requires a lot of moving parts a lot of people um, being involved and there is gonna be some money that has to be paid from somewhere above and beyond what the regional center and government agencies fund um, in order for that to happen. There's some really interesting um, housing innovations on the horizon. As you can imagine, lots of parents and lots of people are trying to figure out, well, if it doesn't exist, let's try and make something happen. There is, a, if you Google intentional housing or intentional communities, it's a concept of bringing together people with disabilities with non-disabled people to live together intentionally in an environment. That's, that's the overarching idea of it. Uh, the one agency that's working on developing intentional communities throughout the country is called the Arch. It's one example of many. Again, if you're interested in learning more about intentional housing or intentional communities, just Google it. And there is a local group of parents who are trying to get something started with this in mind called Friendship San Diego. Uh, so again, I think this is in the early stages of development, but it's one possibility. Via De Vida is in Poway. It's a new housing um, development that was built from the ground up. It's been coming for many years and yay, it's gonna open this summer. I believe they are full, but they have one and a few two bedroom apartments. It's intended for people that, you know, some people may need more supports than others, but again, um, it's for uh, individuals with developmental disabilities to live together in apartments in the Poway area. Again, you can Google their site. Via DeVita also offers some programs and services for adults. You don't necessarily have to be a resident there in order to participate, but they do community outings and kind of do some fun social activities as well. There is a company called Line Investments that's created a, a business called Live Able Communities. And they, if you go again to their website, and I've listed it here, you can read about what their plans are, but they're specifically 
developing housing for individuals on the autism spectrum and the developmental disabilities. And they are working to develop a complex in Lake Elsinore area. I don't know the status on of that as of today, as you can well imagine, these things take a lot of time, require a lot of permitting and so on to get going as any new construction does. But I just share this with you so that you know that there are some um, innovations on the horizon. I put first place Arizona on here. I know it's in Arizona, but it is an interesting model. And I think that there's a lot of interest in this type of model. Again, it's a housing complex that not only provides housing, but they have service providers and services right there in the housing complex, in the community center that help teach and guide individuals to become more independent and learn independent skills right there on site. So unlike what we have available here where someone may be, okay, I'm in my own apartment or I'm in my own condo, but then I have to go out into the community for my supported employment day program services. They try and do a lot of those things right there in the context of where these individuals are living. And so I think it's an interesting concept. And again, uh, you can Read about it if you're interested in it. It's not cheap. I want to say out of pocket for families is probably four to five K a month above and beyond any other social services. So not for the faint of heart in terms of money. Um, so how is housing funded? Is it affordable? Uh, it can be, but it requires a lot of moving parts. A portion of housing can be funded through the individual's SSI check. Those of you who have adult children on SSI, like my, mine are, there's no way that my family members could live on the amount of money they get from SSI. I mean, SSI is supposed to pay for food, lodging, utilities, you know, your, all your living expenses. And even at the, the most they get is 900 and change. And some families get less than that. A lot do, like 600. It's like, where are you going to live in San Diego for that much money? Nowhere. So it's not enough. And that's partly why you see a lot of these individuals still living with their parents or with family members. Um, there might be some access to your Medi-Cal to get some funding. In-home supportive services can be a variable in helping access Housing, Section 8, as I mentioned earlier, private pay, as I mentioned earlier, regional center is definitely involved in helping, and there is a home and community-based um, service waiver that the regional center can help people get, and I can't speak to how much money each and all of these can come into play. I show you this mostly in that there's a lot of different pots of money that might be able to fit into the person's housing situation, depending on what their needs are, particularly if someone has you know, medical needs and needs that level of care to live independently. That's where Medi-Cal and some of these other um, services may also be able to contribute to the housing, the housing support of the individual. But it's, it's a lot of different um, things to consider and possibly get access to, actually. What else do you need to think about as someone approaches 18 or older? Well, there's the, the big C word, conservatorship. Uh, if you need to think about it. The regional center case manager should be talking to you about it, at least putting it on the table so you can learn about it and think about it. Conservatorship, you can apply if it's appropriate once the person turns 18. I often get asked by people, well, can I, can I apply ahead of time so that all the paperwork and all that everything's in there by the time they turn 18 and it's ready to go? The social, uh, the conservatorship will not process and I mean, you can start talking to an attorney. I shouldn't say that, get all your ducks in a row, but the actual paperwork can't be submitted till the person's 18, okay? Um, and then at 18, it's a, it's a court proceeding. Uh, regional center has to be involved. They have to write a summary report of the individual with their recommendations on whether they concur or not that this person should be conserved. So that gets submitted to the court. Uh, there's a court appointed attorney to represent your adult child. So that there's an independent person involved. Some parents will try and file the paperwork on their own. It's doable if you're good with attention to detail and you don't get overwhelmed by it. Other people will hire an attorney to help them with this process. And there's also Legal Aid Society of San Diego who offers a conservatorship clinic. So those are all variabilities. But it's definitely something to learn about, read about. Typically, most of us get a limited conservatorship of the person for our, our adult children. If the person is not on SSI when they turn 18, you should apply for SSI when they turn 18. 
Uh, most of our adult children are considered low income or poor, to be honest with you, because guess what now, even if they still live with you, the social security um, does not consider your income in their income anymore. The reason a lot of us could not get SSI for our kids when they were younger is because they do consider the household income for minor children, but not when they're adults. So when the person turns 18, the only money they consider is what that person makes or what they have. And I would tell you, if your soon to be adult child or adult child has more than $2,000 in a bank account in their name, you need to make that not happen. That needs to go away. A person on SSI cannot have more than $2,000 in the bank in their own name. Now, sometimes people say, oh, I applied and I didn't realize that and I moved the money over. The Social Security Administration is going to catch you on that. You need to do that way before you're going to apply because they're going to look at your bank accounts and they're going to go, oh, well, you just moved that over two days before you applied. Uh, you know, they're going, to, they're going to yell fraud, truthfully, on that. So you've got to plan ahead. And so the individual needs to not have $2,000 any more than $2,000 in their name. And there's lots of well-meaning family members and grandparents who, when the person's graduating, puts money in their bank accounts and all of that, that needs to not be in their name. It needs to be in a different account somewhere else, not in their name. So SSI will, one, look at the financial eligibility, but more importantly, the disability. And so that's a process you fire lots of paperwork and then the Social Security Administration, um, SSI, it's, um, evaluates the individual and deems whether they are disabled and are eligible for SSI or not. Um, so that's, I'm not going to, this is a whole talk about SSI. I encourage people to apply as soon as the individual turns 18, even if it takes four, six, eight, nine months for them to finally approve the person, because once they get approved, they will pay you from the time you applied, not from the date they finally approved you, but from the date you initially submitted the application for SSI. So even if it's a dog fight and they keep asking you for more paperwork and it takes months to get approved, all of a sudden they say, okay, yes, this person's disabled, they qualify for SSI, you're gonna, you're gonna start getting SSI payments. They will pay you a lump sum retro check for all the months that had transpired while you were waiting from the time you applied. So. Waiting to apply is not in your best interest in this situation, because as I said, even if it takes a long time to get approved, once you get approved, they'll pay you, back pay you from the date of application. Uh, you have to think about healthcare options. A lot of people, this isn't on everybody's radar. Guess what happens when you're 18, particularly if you're on Medi-Cal? Pediatricians say, can't see you anymore. Got to find an adult doctor. That's always a real shocker because most of us really like our pediatricians and they've been seeing our kids for many, many years and they know them and we're comfortable with them. But Medi-Cal does not pay for pediatricians to see individuals 18 or older, so they won't get reimbursed. On private insurances and some other insurances, pediatricians, a lot of them will see your children up to age 21-ish, 22, but most, most, I'm not saying all, will not go past 21, 22 years old, there might be a few in pediatricians. So I'm just preparing you and letting you think about navigating healthcare and being aware that um, as your children move into adulthood, you're going to have to find adult providers. And guess what? That's going to happen at Rady's too. For those of you that have neurology and all these specialists at Rady's, um, you got to, that, that's a hard one too, because you got to start transitioning care in many cases. If a person is approved for SSI as an adult, they automatically get Medi-Cal. I'll say that again. If a person gets approved for SSI, they automatically qualify for Medi-Cal and get it. You don't have to apply for it separately, it's attached. Um, there are obviously no hard and fast rules in this. There's gonna be caveats to some of this. Um, and then the other thing that I'll, I'll mention to you is for those of us that are getting older, <laughs> um, and we get closer to uh, retirement age and getting on Medicare ourselves and also getting on um, starting to draw our own Social Security from our work years. Adult dependent children can get on Medicare once we're on Medicare and there's certain rules and timelines for that. And our adult um, disabled children also will receive 50% of our Social Security money 
instead of SSI. So let's say, for example, your child's on SSI and they're getting $650 a month all along. And then you retire and you're starting to draw your social security and your social security is $2,000 a month. Well, half of that's a thousand, right? So guess what? That's more money than the $600 they were getting on SSI. So boom, they're going to get half. They're going to get the thousand dollars um, and going to be on SS, um, social security, su supplemental social security income through your retirement. So I'm just letting you know that. Now, if, if the opposite was true, you retire and you're only getting a thousand dollars a month on social security and half of that's 500 and they were already getting 650 through SSI, then they would just keep getting SSI. So they aren't going to make them take less money. So either way, they would get the same amount and hopefully they would get more. Um, there's something to be said for those of us getting older to delay <laughs> drawing social security for that reason. If we want to try to maximize how much our kids get when we die, a morbid thought, right? It's going to happen. They're eligible for 75% of our social security as a death benefit to them. So 50% when we're alive, 75% when we die. It's really important to create a life plan document for your adult child. And a life plan document, and there's templates for the, this, um, attorneys can provide these for you, but it's basically a little novella, if you will, about your child. So that if you weren't here, you were gone tomorrow, somebody would pick up this life plan document, open it up, and they would be able to say, I know exactly what to do for this person. That's a big job and it's a lot of work, but it's really important. And that's gonna be from, on Mondays we do this, on Tuesdays we do this, this is their favorite food. They like to go to this particular McDonald's. This is who their case manager is at regional center. This is who their doctor is. This is the, all the account numbers for their SSI, for um, their Medi-Cal. This is our pharmacy. All of the things that are in our heads that we know that if we were gone, and someone had to literally step into your shoes tomorrow and pick up where you left off, they could have a place to go. It's, it's, it's a reference of everything about this person. And so it's never too soon to start that. It's a lot of work, but you know, once you get the, the overall life plan document completed, then just updating it periodically as, as things change throughout life. But uh, it's really an important piece of planning for your adult child. Uh, again, um, I'm not an estate planner, financial planning, but I would be remiss if I didn't at least comment on planning for finances and as your child um, moves into the adult world and as we age. So, you know, again, I mentioned income and asset limitations of $2,000 to be eligible for SSI. Um, SSI is just designed to help aged, blind, and disabled people who have little or no income. And it provides cash to meet the basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. Like I said, food, clothing, and shelter, who can, who can live in San Diego on $650 to $900 a month for that? So there you go. Uh, there's a new offering called ABLE Accounts. Uh, again, there's lots of information out there about ABLE, but it's a, it's a program and a way to save money that doesn't penalize the individual for saving. You can save up to $100,000 in a special ABLE account for the individual to be used for specific things and it won't cause them to be um, ineligible for SSI. Um, special needs trusts, very important. You know, you think about when someone dies, they have heirs, you have a will, I'm gonna give everything to my friend Alyssa and Alyssa's on SSI and I gave her everything, guess what? All of these services get wiped out. All of these things get wiped up because now she's not considered low income. And so if she's on Section 8 housing, bye-bye for that. SSI goes away. Um, Medi-Cal may go away. A lot of things could be removed. So you do want to think about preservation of public benefits in your financial planning. The vehicle for doing that is something called a special needs trust. Essentially what happens in a special needs trust is the money goes into the trust and doesn't go to the individual with clear directions about how you want the money used for them, but it's not in their name. Um, again, thinking about who guardians would be if you were gone and creating a plan of care document. So that's financial planning. There's lots of special needs um, planning attorneys, special needs planning individuals in the community who can help you with that so you don't get overwhelmed. But again, really important to think about if you've not already done so. 
Some of you may already be accessing in-home supportive services for younger children. Um, you can get in-home supportive services for adult children who have a lot of needs. IHSS is based upon the needs of the individual. It is not income-based. The only prerequisite to IHSS is the individual has to have Medi-Cal, okay? What IHSS does is provides workers and caregivers to provide services to the individuals so they don't require institutional care. It's cheaper to care for somebody in their own home or in their own environment than it is to have them go to an institutional setting like a nursing home or other institutional type settings. Those are just much more costly. IHSS can actually be a service that families can receive. I've seen it as early as three years old and, and older. I will tell you that the number of hours that, for example, my family got from IHSS increased as they became adults because when someone's 22, 23 years old, they're expected to be able to go to the store and buy their own things. They're expected to be able to make their own doctor's appointments. They're expected to drive or be able to navigate bus systems and things like that. IHSS looks at what a person of the same age typically could do and what does this person need help doing that they can't do because of their disability and they give you a certain number of hours every month based upon that basic criteria. Um, so again, it's something you can apply for. It's another source of um, financial support and caregiving for the family or the individual. So IHSS can um, provide services to people who are living in their own apartments too, by the way. They don't have to just be living at home. It could be in that supported living environment. That's another source of funding. IHSS can help pay for care that's needed for the individual. Uh, this is just um, kind of a random list of things that I wanted to make sure you all knew. I think it's really important um, when we think about planning for adults uh, that we continue to access the many opportunities there are in San Diego. Uh, if you don't have a disabled placking, placard, um, you can apply for one. Autism um, should be able to get be a qualifying diagnosis. Uh, I know we got one when my kids were younger because they were elopers and it was a safety issue to park really far away in the parking lots. And then they would run around and be at risk of getting hit by cars. So we were able to get disabled parking placard because we wanted to be able to park close to the front of wherever we were going, stores, amusement parks, whatever the case may be. San Diego Zoo and Safari Park uh, with paid entrance, you can get a companion pass. I know we have one for my sons so that when they go with their day program, the job coach can get in for free because he's their escort or their companion pass for the day. So you just ask for that as a guest with disabilities and they will provide that for free. They stamp a little icon on your membership cards and you just show that when you go in and they let you in. SeaWorld with paid entrance can get a companion pass free for both day pass and annual passes. Legoland similarly can get a companion pass with paid admission. Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric all offers a, up to 30% discount on utility bills for individuals with low income. So if you've got somebody living in your household on SSI, it's definitely worth looking into SDGE CARA program, California Alternate Rates for Energy program. It can really save a lot on utilities. And if, again, you've got a low income family member like someone on SSI in your household, it's worth pursuing. As I said, Legal Aid Society of San Diego, not only can they assist with um, SSI and IHSS, but they can also assist with housing issues, particularly if there's discrimination issues going on where the person may be living. But they're a really good resource. And as I mentioned, they do also offer a conservatorship clinic. I think it's really important to not miss the continued access to social and fun things to do. The good news is in San Diego, there's lots of things that are still available for adults. They don't stop just because they're grownups. Autism Society, are, the nonprofit we volunteer with, has a surf camp, which is also available for adults. Um, when COVID's finally over, we do offer a summer week-long day camp called Aware for Adults, and we are hoping to resume our monthly pool parties, and adults are always welcome to come and swim at those, and those are free. There is a relatively new nonprofit in San Diego called Limitless Adventures. It's a group of young people who are really into hiking and being outdoors. And monthly, they arrange a group hike walk at various community trails throughout San Diego. It's always very easy. It's not physically challenging. It's pretty flat. And it's for, specifically for individuals with um, disabilities to get together and socialize and go. It's a really nice outing and a nice way for someone who might be a little uncomfortable socializing to just get out and be around other people. Uh, sports for exceptional athletes, again, a 
program to support individuals with disability, ages five and up, all the way to adults, Miracle League, um, also a baseball a softball program for five and up. They also have a challenged um, baseball league in Poway. There's a Tap Fever Studio offers tap lessons for individuals with disabilities. Autism Tree Project is another local nonprofit that has a fair amount of teen and older programs. City of San Diego Therapeutic Recreation um, Services has lots and lots of programs for adults. In fact, I just got their flyer in the mail today. I don't know what they're up to with COVID, how soon they're planning to open back up, but when things do open up, they offer a lot of different programs, including some really awesome summer camps that adults can go to, and you don't have to live in San Diego to access their services. Some of you may not know if you're going to be road tripping any time here soon, um, you can get a free all access pass to all of the federal national parks if you have someone with a disability. So the disabled person can get a free federal national park all access pass, which is really great um, You know, for those of you that are planning to travel. The only one here, I think in San Diego is the Caprillo Monument, but hey, if, you know, somebody wants to go out there and hang out and run around, you can just go to the uh, ranger station there at Caprillo Monument and you can get the pass directly from them and it's an all access pass good for all federal national parks and rec lands. And then of course, Special Olympics is another option. So I just wanted to share this with you so you don't feel like there's nothing out there in the social recreation arena, there are. Uh, this by no means is an exhaustive list, but I did wanna give you some ideas to think about. I think the key with adults is just plan for success. You need to support someone with autism into adulthood can be achieved through thoughtful, careful planning, open communication with everybody involved staying organized and being flexible. So um, again, you know, what we decided when our sons were exiting at 22 isn't exactly the same thing as what they're doing now, being flexible and figuring out what worked, what didn't work. Uh, by no means, if you choose an adult service provider and it's not a good fit, you just say, I need to go a different direction and you change it and you choose a different agency or a different service provider and go, go a different direction. As I said, with self-determination, I think that the, uh, the horizon is broad for, for what's possible. And I'll be really excited to hear from all of you what ideas and, and directions you're going um, as the self-determination project opens up a bit. This is the email. For those of you that are interested in accessing these slides, um, just send us an email to the BHCS period provider at vistahill.org. Uh, you can call us, but the more uh, efficient way I would suggest is just emailing us. Alyssa and I will check this email address and certainly are happy to provide you with the slides. And if you have any specific questions that you'd like to ask us, we would also be happy to answer those for you. Um, let me put our info up here one more time. And sorry, I went a little bit over today. But here we are. So I'm going to let Alyssa, all I can see is that there's 54 comments in the chat. So it's been a busy, <laughs> busy chat today. <laughs> I've gotten quite a few uh, direct messages too. Temporaries that have adult children, you're certainly welcome to jump in at this point. Um, you know, there's a lot to know in this arena. So I certainly am um, by no means the guru of it all, but uh, yeah. So what do you got for us there, Alyssa? All righty. Well, um, first and foremost, you know, the general consensus is that it's really difficult to access some of these services. And I totally understand we're presenting these as options, but we completely understand that getting access into these options is not easy. And the best advice I can give is the squeaky wheel is the one that gets the grease that just like you had to do with the school system, every one of these services, you're going to have to be the one you know, stalking, badgering, doing whatever you can to get them to listen to you and get your child um, access or family member, friend access to these services. 